I have consistently said in my books and in my articles and my workshops that you don't have to go to school for five years to learn to photograph. And in this video, I will actually try to explain the very few things that you have to know uh, technically to photograph. My name is Thorsten Orgaard, I'm a Danish photographer, I travel the world taking photographs and teaching photography. Today I will teach you everything there is to know about photography in 20 minutes. Before we get into it, below the video there is some free downloads I put there for you. All you have to do is put in your email and the code, then the downloads are free. There's two different downloads. One is a book I wrote about iconic photographers and the photograph they took and the story behind them. And I also write how I photograph and why I photograph. There's a link below the video, just put in the code and your email and then you have the download is an ebook in a matter of minutes. There's also uh, free presets and styles for Lightroom and Capture One Pro. Uh, these are the handful of presets and styles that I use for my editing to get it done fast and in the quality that I want. And that's both for colors and black and white. So for example, black and white, there's six, seven uh, different looks for rainy days, uh, different mix. Uh, you will see when you get it. The link is below the video. Just put in your email and the code and it's free and you have it in a few minutes. I'm not trying to pull a legs or BS you or anything like that. I actually do mean that photography is very simple. To start on in a slightly different department I had in a recent workshop, uh, I had two people that uh, were using other camera brands than Leica. Uh, well, I had more than that, but I had those two people uh, got a Leica in their hands and then they couldn't get it quite to work and then the first person asked uh, where's the on button and the on button is actually here uh, you do like this and the camera is turned on and later the same day another person asked exactly the same question of course the answer is exactly the same here is the on and off button and that led me to actually led me into this art this video uh, because i thought why is there even an on and off button on a camera uh, why is it necessary to turn a camera on and off? And it really isn't. Uh, and I thought about it and it actually goes back uh, something like 40 years. So 40 years ago there was a Leica R3 camera that you would turn on and off. And if you didn't, if you forgot to turn it off, then it would use the battery. So it, it keep uh, using the battery for the light meter. And you could say later then we got technology where the camera will switch off automatically after two minutes or ten minutes, whatever you set it to. So you actually don't need an on and off button anymore. The same you could say uh, Steve Jobs was famous for that he didn't want to have on and off buttons on his Apple products. They do have, you can turn off an iPhone, uh, but generally you're not supposed to. You can turn off uh, a MacBook Pro uh, notebook, but you're not supposed to. Generally you just they power down, they go to sleep, and it's basically the same with camera, and that is, you could say, the on and off button uh, doesn't have to be on a Leica. You could say if you go traveling, you're afraid that it's going to use the battery because the shutter release is pressed, it's under pressure, uh, you could just take out the battery, and now it's absolutely, absolutely not going to use any battery. Here is the one thing that you need to know and you need to be able to control in photography, and that is exposure. And exposure is simply that uh, you photograph with enough light. And you can say, in terms of result, it is that things look naturally. They look like they look to the eye. And it doesn't matter if it's color, or black and white. Um, there's a way to control it at the camera. And you can also take, if you look at here, I took this uh, Ansel Adams book uh, with a photograph here. And you can say, you could have a underexposed or overexposed picture that comes out of your camera and then you have to edit it in uh, the computer. And what you edit for is that you want to have uh, things to look correctly exposed. And when we talk faces, the correct exposure is simply the skin tone. That's all you look for. It doesn't matter what color 
or how dark or bright the background is here because maybe it has less light or more light. What you edit for is this skin tone here in where you can say it has the daylight falling on it or the key light falling on the skin tone. Um, and I have another one here, one of my own photos that you can see also. Uh, and again here, this is stage light, LED light, terrible light. Uh, but the thing I edit for is the skin tone. So the skin tone in the face has to look right. Uh, that is the key in anything. And you could say, well, if there's not a face in your photograph, you're taking a photograph of a car or a house or a flower, then that object has to look in the photograph the same as it looked to the eye when you looked at it. That is correct exposure. So how do you get that? You could say, Fundamentally, a camera is uh, a dark room, it's a black box where there's no light coming in because there's a light sensitive sensor inside here. Um, and if we open this camera, we can actually see the sensor. Uh, it looks like this. It doesn't look much, but this is uh, an electronic sensor that sends light. And this one happens to have uh, 60 million pixels. That's beyond the point, it has 10 million or 5 million or 60 million pixels or 150 million pixels. Uh, it's the same principle that each little thing is uh, sensitive to light. So that is why uh, when you have the camera here, it's actually closed. There's a shutter curtain in front of the sensor, so there's no light coming in and hitting the sensor. And then you have uh, three light controls on the camera. So you have one here is the shutter speed. And that is how long is the shutter curtain going up so the light can get in. Uh, and these are like, this one is one four thousandth of a second, one uh, hundred twenty fifth of a second. So that is very brief time because you could say it's one second divided with 125 or one second divided with four thousand. So it's, it's very quick. So it's not a lot of light uh, you need there. So that's the one light control you have on the camera, the shutter speed. Then you have uh, the ISO up here. Uh, on this camera you can set the ISO outside. On many cameras you have to go into the menu. Uh, but here I could set it for example 400 and then it's 400 ISO. And ISO simply just means it's basically the name is International Standard Organization and it's just the standard for how sensitive something is to light. And this one jumps from here 64 to 200 to 400 to 800 and you can say each step uh, increases or doubles the sensitivity to light. So when you go from 100 uh, ISO to 200 ISO, you double the sensitivity. Then you go from 200 to 400, you double the sensitivity again, and so on. Uh, so here you have a possibility, that's why you can take pictures at night, you can go 3200, 6400 ISO, and then you can literally see in the dark, you can see more than you can with the eye. The sensor actually becomes more sensitive than the eye. So that was two of the controls. And then you have the third one is the aperture. Uh, and this is this one. Aperture means uh, hole through. Uh, there's a lot of words in uh, photography that you can actually look up in a dictionary. I also actually have on my website, I have a dictionary of Leica words and photography words. Uh, and when you look up a word like aperture, it means hole through. And that makes sense when you see how it is. You can see here now I turn the aperture and the hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And this control is the third control, and this one goes like the other ones, that each time you turn the aperture, you reduce the light to half, and then half of that, half of that, half of that. So basically with the aperture, you can go from 100% light through down to 2% light. So that's a lot. Um, <coughs> so these are the three light controls, and the reason they are on this camera is so you can control the exposure. And then you say, well, but I have an iPhone or a modern camera that I paid a lot of money for and sometimes my pictures are just not correctly exposed to bright or to dark. And that is where the reason that you have to know how photography works because the camera is set up so it can help you but it actually doesn't know what you're doing or how you're doing it. And here we have, uh, this uh, old school thing is not something you need to have. Uh, this one is so old it, it, the price was three and a half dollars. Today it's uh, $75, so that's us something how long I had it. But this is simply a grey card. And the idea with a grey card is that when it looks middle grey like this, you have the correct exposure. 
Um, but it also means that, we'll put the grey card here, it means that when you put up uh, a grey card, that is how the camera sees the world. So all cameras, iPhone, like a M11 here, like a Q3 and whatever you have, have a built-in light meter. And the way the light meter works is that it expects to see the world as mid-tone, like this. And that works well if you go to Ibiza or New York or somewhere, a cityscape, and you take a photograph and you have the sun behind you, or maybe it's overcast, then the mix of bright buildings and white cars and black windows and this and that, and people walking in blue jackets and so on, the mix of that is this. So that's why the camera tries to, to match this, and that works maybe 70% of the times. But then when you want to take a photograph against the light, if you want to take a portrait of a person where the face is in the shade and there's a lot of light behind because there's sunshine behind the person, the light meter tries to do this. So now you get a face that is underexposed or basically a silhouette. You can say that the picture is correctly exposed, but it's just not what you're photographing. In that case, you have to know uh, that is the face you want and you can see that there's more light behind uh, than on the face, so you have to do something. And one thing to simply do is just you take a photograph um, and then you look at your screen and you see this is too dark and then you can see the shutter time is uh, 1000. Okay, now I'm gonna go down to I'll go down to 125th, I'll take the photo again and that looks nice, let's actually go 180, that's prettier. And now you take the photograph and the face is a miracle. The face is correctly exposed, it looks like a skin tone. The background is blown out but it doesn't matter because it's out of focus usually. Uh, and it's the face you're taking the photograph of. So that's what you need to know to control. And it also means if you go into uh, a restaurant in the evening with just candlelights or low light, uh, when you take a photograph, the camera's going to try to make this one. So that means it's going to overexpose the whole restaurant. So it looks like daylight, basically. Uh, and that means that all the contrast washes out and everybody is going to be white in the face and so on. And in that case, you have to know, I have to turn down the exposure compared to what the camera says. So that's basically all there is, you could say. Uh, there is literally no other, that's not true. There shouldn't be any other buttons on a camera than just exposure. And that is why uh, I like Leica. I like Leica because it's the best lenses in the world. And I like the simplicity of the cameras and the way they feel and they're built and the size of them that I can actually take it with me. But one thing they have is that they have a simplicity that you actually have shutter speed, ISO and aperture sits outside on the camera so I can control it. Whereas you could say, if you take for example an iPhone, you cannot control anything. You can't see what is the aperture. You can, but it's not easy. You can actually change the exposure on an iPhone and so on, and you can change this and that. You can't really change the sensitivity, uh, and, you, and, and it's very limited what you can do. And the idea, of course, is that this is easy to use. And you can say that's one of the good things about an iPhone or smartphones is that if you just want to take photographs and you want something that looked like what you're looking at, it's great. As soon as you import those pictures into computer, you will see that you don't have a lot of it of of ability to edit it because it doesn't have a lot of information. That's what you have real cameras for that they have lenses can actually capture a lot of details and sensor can capture a lot of details and they can hold them so you can actually edit a lot in it without losing uh, definition and quality and detail. When you can say if you just want to take photographs and you want to have a camera with you all the time which you have with an iPhone is in your back pocket on your back when you see something you take a photograph and it looks like that you're there. If you want to up it a little bit and you want to make uh, quality photographs that can last for 50 or 100 years or whatever one you can work with, then you have to have a real camera. And that's actually not such a big step because it just means that now you have to learn how to control exposure. So that is basically what there is to say about exposure. You can say that is the only thing you actually really have to know about photography. I'll tell a few uh, more things because another thing is uh, focusing. And the reason I'll tell about that is because uh, the Leica I just showed you here have manual focus. 
and it's almost unheard of that a camera have manual focus and somehow um, that seems to cause a lot of problems for people that they're like oh my eyes are not so good or it's difficult to focus or and anything but there's actually a lot of advances of doing manual focus and that means that you put the focus you decide what should be in focus what should be sharp and it stays there and once you get into it it's actually a relief that you know where the focus is and you can control it but what is focus well focus is basically distance uh, so you could say you have here I have a little piece of optics and you can say if I want to read this silver text here on my uh, desk plotter then I have to move this one so now it's in focus so I'm moving this one and that's basically the same you do when you turn this one in a lens you're moving the optics so it's first now everything far out infinity is in focus and then I turn it here and then everything uh, two and a half feet, 70, 70 centimeters is in focus. That's all focus do. And that brings me to one of the interesting things that is really old school in a Leica and that is you have a rangefinder. Uh, the Leica is called Leica M and M stands for Messrücker and that's a German word for distance measurement. Uh, and what it does is simply, I look through this one, I actually don't look through the lens, I can't see what the lens see. But I look for a viewfinder here and I basically see a 28mm frame. So even I have a 50mm on here, I see 28mm. And it's uh, clear and bright as daylight. Uh, I can't see what's going to be in focus or not. So it have, in the center of this, it has a focus bracket, a little highlight. And when I turn the focus here, then this piece moves. And that is this eye over here uh, that causes that. So basically when I turn this one, I'm measuring the distance and the way that I see that the distance is a tree over there or a window frame there is that now it's overlapping. So I measure the distance. So if I do that, and I actually do have a window frame here so I can see now it's in focus. I don't know what the distance is but I can see here and it says here it's 4.8 meters. So that's the distance. If I had a laser meter or if I took out something to measure the distance, it would be 4.8 meters. And this is just a way to do it so I can see it in here. Um, <clears throat> then you have autofocus and that is the thing you should understand that autofocus is also measuring the distance. And if we take here the Q3 here is autofocus. So now when I press it here, it's going to focus on the window frame, the same window frame. Uh, and it doesn't tell me what the distance is, it just tells me there's a green light, it's in focus. Uh, the problem, well, the problem, you said a great thing about autofocus is that it should make things fast and it should make it easier for you and it should also mean that if, if you have bad eyesight or old eyes or whatever you think you have, uh, then the camera can make sure that it's in focus. Uh, the problem that, as I see it with autofocus, is that often autofocus picks the wrong thing. So if you want to take a photograph of me, most likely the frame of my glass would be in focus and not my eyes. And you say, if you photograph with an iPhone, nobody can tell because everything is in focus. When you go with lenses like this, that it's more artistic, 2.0, and you can get 1.4 or 0.95. Uh, and especially if you go with Taylor lenses like 90mm, 200mm, then that's gonna, the background is going to be out of focus. So you can't just be sloppy with focus you want and you can say it's an artistic way to direct the attention of the viewer is that you have selective focus that you have that face is in focus because you want people to look at that. And it's interesting how the, how the eye looks at uh, a picture and the first thing we send on is what is in focus. So that's how you direct the viewer that if that face is in focus then that's where the eyes go first and then you read the rest of the picture to see what is the background story or maybe there's more to it. If everything is in focus, different story, then the eye is going to focus on what is highlight or what is really dark, usually, uh, with a tendency to look at faces. So we always, we like to look at faces and if we recognize the face, uh, we look, we, we basically look with recognition as the first thing we see, I know this face. Um, and like a Q3 as this one, you can actually go manual focus, so here is an auto focus, then I can click here. And then now I'm on manual focus. And when, now when I focus through it, then it actually zooms in. So now I can see, and then I can see over here. There it is, the frame is in focus. 
the great thing is now I can sit here and talk forever and then when a reindeer walks by outside I can just take the camera up and take the picture because I have the focus. I don't have to wait for the autofocus, I don't have to tell the autofocus no, it's, that's what I want in focus and not that thing. And that is the blessing of uh, autofocus. But the point I wanted to say is just that focus is uh, a measurement distance. So in this way photography comes down to a very simple thing is first you measure the distance and then you set the correct exposure and you take the picture and then you're going to have a picture that isn't sharp that is sharp and is in focus and it's also correct exposed and that's basically the simplicity of it. Mark my words, that is the simplicity of photography. Then there's other things that are nice to know. There's nice to know about white balance, is how to balance the color so they look like what your eyes see, uh, despite that light that it contains in color and so on. That's something you can control, uh, and there's many other things. Uh, I'll put in uh, a couple of links below the video. I have one thing is a video masterclass uh, about how to be competent in photography, and it deals with basically these elements and a few more uh, in photography and also put a link to my digital photographers extension course which is a course you can do at home at your own pace and it goes through all the basis of photography it explains aperture in detail and why is a lens called 50 millimeter and 90 millimeter uh, what's the idea of all this jazz Then you could say now that you master uh, photography because you can master exposure or at least you know that this is what you're aiming at to get the correct exposure, then come of course the more artistic or philosophical question and that is what to put in the frame. And my answer to it basically is you just photograph. You could say your main talent as a photographer is that you wanted to have a camera for some reason you want to have a camera and that is the energy and the enthusiasm that's going to drive the work and then you take photographs of whatever you like to take photographs of and as you go on it's going to start making sense other people are going to look at your picture and they're going to say wow I really like this one, I really like this one and I usually say, I'll say this very short, but I usually tell people that as you go on and this could take months or years or almost a lifetime at some point you can realize that your style and what you're known for and what you're really good at is often what is really easy for you. This is what comes natural to you. But we seem to have an urge that we get the camera, we want to learn everything about it and now we want to learn how to photograph. So that we start studying rule of thirds and we st study uh, famous photographs and we try to be like them. Uh, and that might <laughs> lead somewhere or nowhere. but. Where it's aiming at is that you have to believe in yourself and that is when you start photographing what you like to photograph, the way you want to do it, that is actually what is your style and that is what is unique about you and nobody can copy. And I'll tell a funny story because as I was uh, doing this and some articles and, and some chapters in the book, I was thinking about that when I started writing, um, I started, I started publishing my first magazine when I was 11, uh, 12 years old uh, with a friend. Uh, we met in school and I wanted to write and I wanted to publish. I knew I was a writer, uh, so of course I had to write. And I had actually bought or had gotten this book that was called 591 Jokes. It was a little pocket book and I thought those jokes were so good in it. It was all written jokes, there was no drawings, but the jokes were so good that I wanted to publish them. So that was what I was writing. I was basically just writing the same jokes and maybe I started inventing my own. And then I met uh, a friend in school and he could draw. And that is how we made a magazine that had comics and drawings and jokes. And it was basically based on just uh, that book and then we evolved from there. So what I'm trying to say with that is like, yeah, you can be a photographer just because you know that you want to photograph and you want to have a camera and you have to do something but you actually don't know yet why, why you have it or what you're supposed to photograph and that's totally okay it's gonna come along the way and I'm sure if you go look at people who uh, have played and composed music 
they started out with just they wanted to have a guitar or they wanted to have an instrument or they wanted to be singing on a stage or use their voice. But what are you going to sing about or what are you going to photograph about? And that will come later. Uh, and one of the, the things I also stumbled into here as part of my project is that I did a book uh, uh, some years later. Uh, and this is this book after tsunami. It's actually 19 years ago uh, that there was a tsunami in Southeast Asia. And I went there and I actually didn't go as a photographer. I went as a volunteer. I wanted to help uh, because a lot of people uh, had died and uh, had lost their homes and the fishers had lost their fishing boats in Sri Lanka and India and, and so on. Uh, so I wanted to go help them. Uh, so I flew in uh, and from my team we were 496 uh, volunteers from around the world, mainly Australia, Germany and uh, the US, and but basically all over the world. And when I arrived, of course I brought my camera, uh, but when I arrived one of the things they said in the headquarters like we need somebody to collect all the photographs that the volunteers have taken because they had the small digital cameras and phones and whatever they had. Uh, and they needed uh, those photos for the history of what actually had happened because it was so unbelievable the work that went on so if you didn't have pictures to to show this nobody would believe it and you could say it would be forgotten it's kind of like classic photography so i ended up uh, traveling around india and sri lanka uh, for three weeks and yes i did collect all the photographs but i also made uh, a lot of photographs and back then it was mainly uh, film or shooting a slide film uh, and I made uh, this book um, and you say suddenly uh, my interest to take photographs and my talent for it uh, and you could say I could also write made me do a book that documented this whole thing. I actually did slideshows and I did a website and I wrote a lot of articles and, and so on. Uh, and what I'm getting at with that is that yeah you have a camera, now you find something to photograph uh, and there is no rule book or anything you can go to university or school and learn what should you tell. It is whatever you want to tell the story and you could say for example in a recent workshop I had uh, a, uh, a workshop student who brought pictures, he had done an infrared, uh, he had taken a photograph with an infrared camera and it's just a way so it looks black and white but it kind of looks uh, odd because you're photographing uh, you could say the temperature of the color so normally a tree would have white leaves instead of green so it can look almost like some Japanese slow, snow landscape but it isn't. Uh, what he had done is he had tried to preserve uh, by photographing 500 year old trees and 200 year old trees in the south of the US and it just looked amazing. It was like a fairy tale and actually some of the other guys in the workshop said hey can we buy these photographs and that was not his intention. His intention was just he wanted to photograph, he wanted to play with infrared light and he wanted to preserve those trees. Another example in the workshop is uh, a guy who has three uh, girls, three children and so much of what he does for photography is just he takes photographs of his family and his, uh, his girls. And you would say those pictures are also great, but it's not like everybody in the workshop says, hey, can I buy that picture? Because why would you buy that picture? It doesn't have much value for you, but it does have a lot of value for that family. And you would say for that person that is in the photograph, uh, when she is four years old and eight years old, 11 years old, when she turns 18 and 25 and 30 and 50, those pictures suddenly have a value and that is also storytelling. So it's not like you have to publish a book or write articles or be on the front page of uh, New York Times, but you have to photograph something and that's basically only you who can, who can know that as you move on. Then there's one more thing that is really important uh, in photography and that is not a technical thing and it's not even artistic. It is simply just a practical advice or practical reality of things is that you have to always wear a camera. And that is my slogan. It says even on my camera straps here it says always wear a camera. The disc plotter here says always wear a camera. Um, and if we go back to the on off button it's like it doesn't have to have an on-off button, it should just basically be on all the time. Uh, you should have it uh, across the body, I think, like this. 
so here it hangs on the hip here, so I can feel it all the time. It doesn't fall off my shoulder or something. So I know the camera is here, and this camera happened to have a size. Um, so I can always feel it there. It's super professional, uh, but it's, it's small. And it even to some people, most people who doesn't know what it is, it looks like a ridiculous antique camera that I, that I got from my granddad or something. Uh, so I basically look harmless with it. And in a way I am, but I do take uh, high resolution pictures and I can take a lot of pictures without anybody noticing because I always have the camera with me. And with that also means that you don't, shouldn't have a lens cap on the camera. It should be on, it should be ready. And usually when I walk around with a camera, I think about what is the light condition. So I'll set it for daylight hours if I'm outside. And if I go inside or the sun goes down in the evening, I set it to a high ISO. Uh, so basically I have the camera with me and I am ready to take photos of whatever whenever. It doesn't mean that I shoot around wild. Uh, I just have the camera and you can see an interesting thing is also when you have a camera with you, you start thinking uh, in photographs. It's not like you're looking around and you can't concentrate but you just notice uh, things when there is a photograph you recognize and you can take it because you have your camera with you. Part of that is also I usually have one lens, it's a 50mm, so I see everything 50mm, so that is basically what I look for. I don't look for wide angle and telephoto and in between, I look 50mm. So if there's a cute bird or an airplane up there, it doesn't really matter for my photography, I can look at it and say that's a nice bird, but I know I cannot take a photo of it, so I don't even have to think about it or try it. So it's not a photo, I don't recognize it as a photo. The same way, uh, something that looks beautiful as a wide angle of, wow, I want to photograph this whole room. I can't because it's a 50, so I don't even have to think about it. So in that way, it makes it very simple uh, that I just have 50 and I have the camera with me and it's ready. If I wanted to simplify things even more, I would say get a black and white camera or just know that everything you photograph is black and white. You don't have to worry about the colors. So that is a practical little thing and if you look for the history of great photographers uh, take a guy like Elio Evit that just passed away uh, a, a short while ago he has a huge catalog and he did work as a professional photographer but he also said I always have a camera with me always I almost always had a camera with me so you will see some of his grand photos is of friends kissing on a holiday it's one of his most famous photographs actually when he was on holiday and not Working as a photographer, he still had the camera with him. There's other of his children looking uh, out the window in New York. Also an example of something happens and you have a camera with you. So that is a very important detail of being a photographer. That's all I had to say for today. Thank you for watching and remember, till I see you next time, to always wear a camera. And of course, remember, there is free download links below the video. Thank you.